Thanks very much indeed, Tommy and Azer and everybody for organizing this. It's been fun putting this presentation together. And it did remind me, I think my first publication with Andrew Miller and Neutrons was in 1984. <clears throat> that was using uh, ISIS uh, nearby here at Oxford. But of course, I've been heavily involved with ILL over the years and the complementation between deuterium NMR and deuteration in, in neutrons was clear to me very early on in, in my career and, and, and a number of papers have come out with both methods in the same publication and it's been really fun to do I have to say. I have to admit now that I've now mandatory retirement in Oxford you have to leave at 70 so I've been gone from Oxford for uh, about six months now so um, <clears throat> but it was fun putting this together and thank you for inviting me along. I did look at the profiles of everyone um, and I think I saw NMR in two of them and I don't know and Tommy you might be able to tell me if you're close to this whether everyone is familiar with NMR or not or should I just give a brief overview of NMR to help people what do you think I think a very brief overview would be helpful. Right. Okay, a brief overview then. Right. And I've seen some of the early talks, so I, I, I know what to do. Okay, good. So, NMR, what can it give us? Um, it can give us molecular structure and identification of unknown chemical substances. It's used for quantitative analysis. It's used in analysis of mixtures, in particular in food industry, for example, it's important there. We can get dynamics and the dynamic time scale I will address because that's very important in biology. If it doesn't move, it often doesn't do anything. So that's important. Um, I put this in on top of this slide from Joe because many of you may well have had or know people who've had MRIs and scans and so on. And this is exploiting proton NMR, this is where it all came from. Uh, dynamics in terms of chemical reactions, speed reactions, binding sites and drug discovery and so on. So it's important here, but also uh, diffusion coefficients, conformational polymers. I know some people work on uh, biomaterials and it's really quite prominent in there. Indeed, a lot of the wide line and solid state NMR uh, methods came from um, looking at block copolymers. <clears throat> so that's a general outline of what it can do. What is it? Well, it's simply a form of absorption spectroscopy. So it's no different from optical spectroscopy, except that you need a high magnetic field or a magnetic field at least to get the spectral lines. Um, only certain nuclei can be uh, observed, natural abundance nuclei. For example, protons, N14, phosphorus, all important in biology. And I will tilt this towards biology always, of course. And uh, the detectable nuclei all have a so-called magnetic moment, which means they are NMR active. So you can't see everything, but you can see some nuclei. And that can be a big help, or also it can be a big disadvantage. So the natural abundance nuclei that are important for biology to silence are, for example, carbon-12 natural abundance, um, carbon and isotope, and also oxygen 16. But isotopes are detectable. For example, for protons, we have deuterium, which is going to be the focus here, tritium, which is very high sensitivity, carbon 13, for example, uh, N15 is also quite important because N14 is quite different in its NMR characteristics from N15 and also O17. I won't mention much about that today um, because O17 is only visible really with solid state NMR. It's a special methodology uh, and we've published certainly in that area as well. So bear that in mind that you're only looking at specific nuclei and very often placing those specific nuclei gives us very direct and specific information. As I mentioned, the samples are placed in a strong magnetic field. You can actually do zero magnetic field NMR but typically for the kind of applications uh, in biology and life sciences, this is anywhere from five to about 25 Tesla. And we're now getting up to a little bit higher than that now with magnet technology, which is a major limitation in the field. <clears throat> and then these samples are irradiated, usually radio frequency in the megahertz range, 
And um, by putting the sample in a superconducting magnet, such as shown here in this cartoon, um, here is a kind of spectrometer setup. Here's the magnet. Um, and then this is where all the electronics are. And we send in some radiation into the sample here. <clears throat> and then a coil measures the absorption spectrum that comes out. And the absorption spectrum here is, 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 is a kind of way of looking at which of the nuclei you can observe for protons, the high magnetic field. And then you can tune your spectrometer to almost any other nuclei that, that's visible. And this just shows the relative positions of some of the lines. Fluorine is, is, is a pretty good nucleus. Um, I mean, I think 40% of all drugs are fluorinated, for example. So fluorine is a very good methodology for looking by NMR at drug action. There's phosphorus here, of course, in nucleotides and phospholipids. I won't talk much about that because we've got deuterium as the, 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 the focus here. Lithium, you've got carbon, 13, you've got silicon, and you've got deuterium down here. <clears throat> this is going to be important because you can tune your NMR machine to look at deuterium if you like, but you can also tune uh, your machine to look at protons, but deuterium can help you. And I'm going to show you how that happens. So this is the kind of spectrum that you would tune your um, NMR machine to. And it's within the proton lines here that you would get that information about proton MR or carbon lines where you might get the information here. So focusing in on this particular frequency range will give you the information you need by proton MR. So just bear in mind that an NMR machine is simply a way of tuning to get absorption spectra at different wavelengths, much like you tune a radio at home with different frequencies. <clears throat> what can we learn? Well, here are some basic parameters. I won't dwell on these during the talk, but I will certainly allude to them. Chemical shift is very important. This tells you information about the composition of atomic groups within a molecule. It can tell you bond angles around peptide bonds, which is fundamental to structural determination. And very importantly, something that's missed by almost every other methodology is the ionization state or the PK. So NMR is very sensitive to the electronic configuration around the nucleus, and you can plot out PKAs of individual residues within a protein or a biomolecular complex. Very precise with single electron changes are, are, are uniquely uh, sensed, um, detected by NMR. We also have something called spin-spin coupling. So this is when two nuclei come together and the information about adjacent atoms is then um, resolved. And that's what we use to pull out structure. If you know the distance between two atoms, then you can work out the structure. Relaxation time, this is um, how a nucleus responds to a pulse of radiation. In other words, how it uh, returns to equilibrium gives us information about molecular dynamics. And there is overlap now between the kind of things Ilpo was talking about earlier today and molecular dynamics in terms of time scales. And we should never forget the fact that biology is a highly dynamic system and NMR can probe the biologically relevant dynamic timescales required for function. <clears throat> and signal intensity, um, there's a lot of complications about this, but I, I, I won't go into them in detail, but it gives quantitative information. For example, the ratios of the molecule can be helpful for determining molecular structure and proportions of different compounds in a mixture. And this is, in a biotechnology context, absolutely vital um, in industry and a major activity. This is a, a, a cartoon of a structure of just simply ethanol. And you can see the coupling that occurs in these lines. You can now resolve exactly what is in your molecule. And this is a proton spectrum. So it's these hydrogens that we're looking at in this particular um, spectrum. So all spectra are much like this or much more complicated. And I will show you some. So why would you use NMR? <clears throat> If you can't get a crystal, for example, you have fibers, amyloid fibers, if you have a disordered system, spider silks, which we've worked on, for example, or just polymers, and I know some people are working on polymers. Um, so it's ideal to look at these systems. You may have a heterogeneous mix, multi-component systems, a drug plus a target and so on. You might work, want to work totally in solution and cellular NMR is now uh, becoming uh, viable. You may want to vary conditions such as pH, salt, and so on. 
And you may want to look at binding kinetics and energies to other molecules. Uh, and it, the dynamic aspect of NMR helps you with that a lot. And you might want to understand stability, folding and unfolding. And most of protein folding work has come from NMR methods. I won't dwell on that, but deuterium hydrogen exchange is one way of doing that. And you might want to measure fast dynamic processes. NMR relaxation times can get you down to the nanosecond type time scale. <clears throat> Now you've been listening to diffraction and scattering methods already um, in this course. And each data point in any of your diffraction bands contains information about each atom within the asymmetric unit. So that means diffraction methods, scattering methods are long range methods. And that's important to, 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 to bear in mind that difference. Whereas in NMR, each data point contains information only about one single atomic distance or angle process. So NMR is a short range method, very good for short range interactions, typically over the one to 10 angstrom or one uh, um, to, to, to one nanometer time scale, uh, length scale. So it's a short range method and that's quite important. And people often don't distinguish between those two um, differences of the methodologies. The size of a magnet matters, how big the field is, you get better spectra. The higher the field, the better resolution, the better the data, as usual. So technologically, pushing the high field strength is really quite difficult. We've now got to something like 1.2 Tesla, but um, field strength is, is technically very, very difficult to achieve, just the engineering and the way of producing these superconducting magnets. So that is important. Um, and then also the size of the biomolecule matters. The larger the molecular mass, usually the worse the spectral resolution. And this actually is where deuterium comes in and helps. So it's predominantly a solution state method. In other words, purified macromolecules in solvents with isotop uh, isotopic uh, uh, substitution, sorry for the mistake there, is typically what we do um, when you can take a global view. Here is a protein in solution, produces lots and lots of spectral lines and absorption spectrum. They're all characteristic of their environment. We use multiple methods and um, people like Kurt Vertrick, uh, for example, got Nobel Prize for measuring it for resolving these multi-dimensional ways of taking these spectra and then reassessing them. And then from this, we get to distance constraints and we get to uh, structural determination. And one thing that is quite different from rigid atom diffraction patterns in NMR is as you can see here, you see conformational uh, spaces being explored by structural elements within this protein. In other words, you see the dynamics, you see that there's lots of motion within these kind of these proteins, um, rather than the rigid atom position, which you see in X-ray diffraction, but you then may see diffuse uh, electron density, which is, which is what NMR is telling you here. And this is done in solution, not in a crystal, of course. And you may get, distance constraints, this is for interleukin one beta, but uh, you can also then get RMS. And then of course you can put that in the protein database in exactly the same way as you can for diffraction. So short range distances, bond angles and charge state, dynamics, and you need good spectral resolution. Membrane proteins though, and I've been asked to focus on membrane proteins are large. So they are fighting against all of the things I've been saying about getting nice high resolution because when you have lipids present as well, these complexes are now mega dolphins. They're huge. And these large molecules and large complexes cause broadening due to slow tumbling. And if you have slow tumbling in solution of these large complexes, you get loss of resolution. Just to show you this is ubiquitin, but much like the interleukin I showed you a moment ago, just 76 amino acids tumbling freely in solution. If I now compare that with a membrane transporter, it's actually a glucose transporter in a membrane, which is only 100 kilodaltons, but in bilayers, this is the kind of spectrum you get. So this looks hopeless. It looks as though there's no way that you can get any spectral resolution from this, from a carbon-13 absorption spectrum of this particular system. But what I'm going to tell you is that there are methods, and deuterium can help us get that. And this is by using something called solid state NMR. I said it's a solution state, so everything is aqueous or in solution, but solid state NMR looks at large macromolecular complexes. 
still in solution, they're not solid, although you can use the same methods to look at solids, block copolymers and so on. So solid state is a way of extending the molecular weight range of NMR into a useful system. And it's a system, it, it's a methodology that's been around since about the mid 1990s in uh, biology and uh, people like Stanner, Paolo, Bob Griffin and so on have been leaders in this particular field of method development. You need some real technical development and it is a technical development and we've been involved in those too. And there are two approaches. One is to actually exploit these broad lines with wide line NMR. So exploit the wide lines to try and get information out of these. And I'll show you those in a moment. The other is to spin the biomolecular complex at high speed. So all the magnetic interactions, mainly from protons, which cause this broadening I mentioned here, they're, 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 it's possible to, to, to average those out by spinning the sample. And normally the spinning speed is 50 kilohertz. And again, technologically people are going faster and faster. We average out the anisotropic magnetic interactions, which many of you will know about from diffraction scattering data but at the magic angle. Now, why is the magic angle important? Well, all of the interactions, magnetic interactions, of course, have a, a, a spherically average uh, dependence. And the spherical averaging is given by three cos squared theta minus one, as always, that's just geometrical. But at theta equals 54.7 degrees, the magic angle, this reduces to zero. So if you take a complex like this, you spin it at the magic angle, in the rotary, in the NMR machine, you can start to get high resolution light spectrum. And that's the principle of magic angle spinning. It's not that simple. It's, there's lots more going on in terms of the pulse sequences methodology. This, it is a way of looking at large complexes to, to get uh, high resolution type information. So that's very schematic, it's very basic, but that's the principle of the methodology. Um, for those of you who are interested in, 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 in the, the magic angle, um, intuitively, if you think of a cube of unit size, so every axis is one, and then you draw the diagonal from one corner to the opposite corner, it makes an angle of 54.7 degrees with every axis. So that means every, um, every position of, of coordinates, x, y, z, then are reduced to the same value. And so that is uh, the magic angle explained in an intuitive, uh, non-rigorous way. But it's a nice, easy way to think about it. What does that do to our NMR spectrum? Well, here is a typical powder pattern NMR spectrum like I showed you before. It's actually of a phosphorus in a membrane. If we now start to spin that sample in the membrane, in the NMR machine, what happens is the lines start to get narrower and narrower. In fact, the distance between these lines is exactly the spinning speed, and until you're spinning faster than the spectral width of this in Hertz, you get a single line. So that is exactly what happens um, for an individual particular system. Uh, so this is very cartoon-like, but I hope it helps. <clears throat> right, so protons is the most sensitive NMR nucleus I showed you earlier, but it's too abundant. There are too many of them. The spectrum can be really complex, complicated and complex to, to, to analyze and to out information. And this is a common feature of NMR. There's too much data and we don't know how to analyze it completely. For large biomolecules in particular, they are then broadened due to the slow motion I was telling you within the magnetic field, unless you use magnetic angle spinning. So we need ways of simplifying spectra or detecting other nuclei. And that's where the tricks come in. That's where the expertise comes in. Uh, of using NMR successfully in, in, in the life sciences. So isotopic substitution I alluded to earlier can be used through expression to put in labels of specific sites of interest. For example, chemically you can introduce them into a ligand or a protein as a ligand by expression into side chains, for example, or you can put it uniformly into a backbone of a protein. And usually you, you need multiple samples and you can add and subtract and, and convolute different spectra to pull out the information that, that is required. And then multiple labeling techniques with different carbon compounds and sources can help you. And common isotopic substitutions of C13 for C12, N15 for N14, or deuterium for protons uniformly in D2O, 
or specifically if you want to label methyl groups. And this is a very um, active area of labeling methyl groups with deuterium to simplify the proton spectrum from the, 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 the methyl groups left behind. And here's a way of doing that, for example, using D-glucose. Um, here we have labeled deuterium here on the alpha carbon, and then you can label the side groups with deuterium as well. So what you're doing by adding deuterium is diluting out protons, and that's where the deuterium comes in, and that's where it's powerful. So if you do a proton in a mass spectrum now, you can only see these protons on the nitrogen and not the C alpha protons, and you can do the opposite experiment as well. So that's one way of using deuterium in NMR. Deuterium is also used to suppress large solvent signals in proton MR. Now, if you're dissolving your protein in water, the vast majority of your signal is going to be water proton. And so one way is to dissolve in D2O, um, and it needs to be a very high level of D2O because uh, even a small amount of H2O will give a signal. And then here you can see that you can reduce this signal here, which is predominantly water in the sample. So you can start to get the narrow spectral lines without water being there. Um, this is just for a small molecule of caffeine, for example, which has been dissolved in water. Technically, it's becoming less of an issue these days. NMR machines are now being fitted with, with a ways through software of suppressing the water signal. But it certainly has been a very valuable method um, uh, uh, of using DITO in the past. It's getting less important. But there is one other important aspect to this. NMR machines can drift. If you're looking at a biological sample, you might need to take a spectrum over many hours or even days. And so the field can drift, the electronics can drift. But the D2O, the deuterium in the sample, you add some D2O, can produce a signal which the NMR machine can look at. I said it's NMR active. And you can look at this and produce it and, and, and use it as a so-called lock signal. So that means the NMR machine goes back to this lock signal and fixes on that one unchanged signal and then adapts the uh, software so that the spectra are all corrected for any instrumental drift. For example, in the magnetic field or the electronics, you know, if the room heats up, then the electronics work differently. And because the change in the position of these lines are extremely minute, they're very, very uh, small indeed, this is still a very important way of keeping the machine on, 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 on field. You can also use deuterium to increase spectral resolution. These exchangeable protons I mentioned can be reduced. And here is a particular system where the amide and carboxylic acids here can change out the, this is a simple antibiotic, can then increase the spectral resolution as you can see. And also in lines here, for example, this has got much better resolution than in water in this position here. And so by exchanging out using deuterium, it can be a major advantage. And then also having used deuterium to help the machine and to help resolution of other nuclei or protons, we can also exploit deuterium as a nucleus in its own right. It has a magnetic moment, spin one, it is detectable and I won't go into the details, but it's a so-called quadrupolar nucleus. It has two detectable spectral lines. Now you've been listening to oriented membranes, you've been listening to systems where you have lipids and so on. And this orientational dependence of the two lines has been very, very important indeed. There's thousands of publications exploiting this particular feature of deuterium NMR. So a typical deuterium NMR spectrum of a single rapidly rotating deuteron it could be a deuterated lipid in chloroform, for example, um, or it could be just D2O. It's an isotropic, everything's average due to fast spinning rapidly, typically faster than milliseconds phase, like a solvent. And that's a single line because all of the anastropic interactions that you have associated with this spin one are average. If you have fast motion that's isotropic, this is the deuterium NMR spectrum you get from wherever the deuterium is in your biomolecule. But if you have a partially ordered system, for example, a liquid crystal or a bilayer membrane where you've been, you've been listening to, such as this, then you can get two spectral lines. The deuterium is still undergoing fast motion, but now it has an orientation with respect 
to the magnetic field north-south in your uh, magnet. And that is really quite important and very, very informative. And I'll give you some examples of that. So um, just to give you an example here, this is from a nice article in the early days from Michael Sattler, who's an expert in this area. Proton-proton magnetic interactions are very strong. They give the broad spectrum to dipolar coupling, so-called 100 kilohertz in energy, and I'll come back to that. So it results in broad spectral lines, but partial deuteration, as I mentioned earlier, suppresses the spin diffusion between all these protons, which is broadening the spectrum. And so if you do that, then you get the narrow lines. So the signal to noise, the line widths in the spectrum, the remaining protons is significantly uh, reduced. Now, this is one way in which the tumbling of small molecules um, it gives narrow lines, but large molecules give broad lines. This is one way of extending the molecular weight range, and it's good for large proteins. So that's pushing the molecular weight limit, as we call it, for solution state NMR by giving narrower spectra. And here's just uh, one of these so-called two-dimensional spectra. This is carbon-13 against protons. I won't go into detail, but I think you can qualitatively see here that the lines in this region are quite broad, but here they've now been resolved into a number of individual lines. And that's just due to this proton deuterium exchange um, in this system, a partial deuteration for expression that's been used. So um, I just need probably to allude to some more recent and very recent um, approaches just to, to, to acknowledge that people are still looking at these problems of trying to make the method available for much larger complexes. And you can simply, uh, it's not simply, but a lot of effort has gone into making different so-called pulse sequences. A feature of NMR is that pulse sequences are always given these acronyms, names. And this is just a new one that's come out uh, relatively recently. And what they're doing here is changing the way in which they pulse method, in other words, the way the radiation is pulsed into the sample has been changed so that we don't need deuteration in the sample, which is what this says here. But one of the reasons is that so far, there's no successful production of deuterated proteins from a mammalian cell line. So if you want to produce a protein in a mammalian cell line, bacterial works, and a lot of people are doing that, but in a mammalian cell line, Therefore, that limits NMR application to these kind of proteins, which can't be deuterated. So the aim is to record the signal of a central methyl group in this model system, which is C13, which is black labeled here, and by diluting out the proton signals nearby, which are making a broad spectrum. And this also fast so-called um, methodology is sending radiation from local nuclei in a particular way to get a high resolution spectrum without the need to dilute out the spins from the deuterium. If anybody's interested, the reference is there. And it also increases the sensitivity of experiments as well. And if you just want to have a look qualitatively, this is a, a, a kind of absolutely standard first experiment you might do by NMR. And there's a line that's been looked at. Here is another type of pulse sequence. Here's another one. And then here is the most recent one. And I think you can see from here to here, the resolution of this, just one line that they have picked out gets much better with this new pulse sequence. So just so that I'm uh, paying tribute to the people doing uh, instrumental developments and technological developments without deuterium in difficult systems, there are alternative approaches. So this introduction, just to summarize, deuterium can be a nucleus in wide line MR to be exploited to give information. Secondly, deuterium is a nucleus that can be used to improve the data from other nuclei. So that's, those are the two kind of bottom lines from this introduction. So what I'm going to do now is to give you some examples. Um, all of you are familiar with membrane systems. So this is focused on membrane proteins and membranes. Um, and also I'll give you some technological in, in, in input at the end. So the first one I'm going to talk about is lipid in bilayer membranes. We're all well aware, you've just been hearing uh, talks uh, looking at lipids in bilayer membranes. What can deuterium NMR do for us for lipids in bilayer membranes? Well, let's go back to this slide. I told you that deuterium has a spin one. It's a quadrupolar moment. It has two spectral lines, which are sensitive to orientation. 
And often we want to know the orientation and also dynamics of particular groups and particular parts of the membrane. It's in low abundance, so enrichment is necessary. And what we're going to do now here is our NMR machine. We can tune it over all these nuclei. And here is deuterium way down here. And the further you go down to zero field in this particular spectrum, the lower the sensitivity. So deuterium is first of all low in natural abundance, but also low in sensitivity. So you might think it's not worth bothering with, but indeed it is. <clears throat> So the quadrupolar nucleus means that unlike protons and spin one, spin half nuclei, which have a completely isotropic distribution of nuclear charge, deuterium has a non-spherical positive charge distribution. And so this is like going from a, a, a soccer ball to a rugby football, soccer being quite popular at the moment. Of course, everyone's watching the matches and they're not watching these lectures. Rugby is pretty important in, in, in Britain and in France and some other countries as well. So I always imagine um, this kind of nucleus like a, like a rugby football. So that means the electric field gradients across this molecule are asymmetric. If you look at it along one axis, it's got a larger interaction than across the other axis. And that's what gives the anisotropy and the orientational dependence. So the magnetic interaction of the applied field is now not isotropic, but anisotropic. You are all anisotropic. You're tall, you're anything from, you know, a meter 15, two meters, whatever, and you're also narrow across your shoulders and your body. So you are fully anisotropic in a system. If I threw you at the back of an airplane, spinning very quickly in all orientations, you would become isotropic. So spinning, molecular motion in this case, can give you an isotropic-like spectrum. And that's why deuterium in solution gives you a single line. But in an oriented system where it's restricted, it gives you an isotropy. And this is really quite powerful. <clears throat> so here is the deuterated lipid in oriented membranes, exactly the kind of systems I was looking at in the 1980s by neutron diffraction and also by deuterium NMR, which is very new in those days. Um, it was quite a new approach in methodology, and we complemented the neutron and the NMR data together. So I've got a magnetic field in my magnet. Like any magnet, it's got a direction. Along parallel to the normal, it will give you two spectral lines. And this is uh, tutorated, for example, in the chain or, for example, in the head group. If we now um, have a, a static uh, field parallel to the membrane normal, the membrane normal is here. So I just turned my membrane from one orientation to another, the lines have a different separation. So in other words, we can work out the orientation of the CD group in our lipid from this quite precisely, given that kind of spectrum. And there's a huge amount of literature on liquid crystals doing exactly that. <clears throat> if we now smash our membrane up into so-called liposomes or a powder pattern, we get spherically averaged pattern. Now don't forget, each of these lines will have a spherical distribution, starting off here in the parallel orientation through to here in the perpendicular orientation. And that is a powder pattern. And that's typically what we would get from a liposomal system that's not tumbling quickly. So that's large liposomes, not small. Small liposomes will give you an isotropic, uh, isotropic spectrum if they're tumbling faster, if they're smaller than about 100 nanometers. It's large liposomes, large membranes, natural membranes can give you that kind of spectrum if they are deuterated, or even the very similar from phosphorus, which is a spin half nucleus, which is half of that pattern. So this can be quite important to look at the morphology of the system we're looking at. <clears throat> and just to show you how that works, this is a glass plate in a bilayer, and you can see that the lines cross over, and that crossover point there for the spectral lines is actually the magic angle again, and then comes through to here. So you can do an orientational dependence in your um, oriented system if you, if you want. So that is what's happening to the spectral lines for this system going to this system. That is the trajectory that the spectrum will take. What can we get from this? Well, this is the NMR parameter. It's this parameter here, which is called the quadrupolar splitting for deuterium. It's the distance between the lines. And the quadrupolar splitting, which is typically in hertz or megahertz, 
is very large compared to normal NMR spectra. It can be up to about 200 kilohertz and uh, some quadrupolar nuclei are even eight megahertz wide, often 17, for example. So to do NMR, you don't need high resolution for these systems. In fact, you, you can use a machine that, 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 that doesn't have very high spectral resolution because these lines are easily measured. So the quadrupole splitting is explicitly given by these constants here times this parameter, which I've come across before, it's three cos squared theta minus one. So that theta gives a measure of the amplitude of motion of our CD group, which could be here at the head groups or in the chains. The line shape of this spectrum and relaxation properties gives us information about dynamics. So here, for example, is a rigid aromatic residue. Here is a methyl group rotating around a C3 axis. And here are phenyl groups uh, flipping in a protein. And all of these we've observed and others in amino acids in proteins to give some information about specific residue orientation and also motion within a protein. Um, and that, that there's a whole literature on those, but I won't go into more detail, just to say that deuteration can give you quite detailed information, both in solids, biomaterials, but also in biological systems. So here we have dynamics and we have amplitude. <clears throat> Amplitude of motion, of course, gives you an order parameter, and dynamics gives you the rate of motion. And these two are quite important. You can have order parameters with slow motion and fast motion, and you can have dynamics, slow motion, fast motion. So you can pull these out with your theorem quite explicitly. So lipids in bilayer membranes is an example. Order parameters of lipid chains. Now what we're doing is putting the deuterium at all the different places in the chain here is DPPC, dipyrmidol, phosphatidylcholine, as we go down the chain. And these are the lines from each of the parent spectra that I just showed you a minute ago. This is not oriented. And here are the order parameters plotted out. <clears throat> this was first done by spin labels and electron spin resonance um, by us, in fact. But then also we did it, and people like Joe Sadie did it, for deuterated membranes. And you can see that there's a lot of order in the upper half of membranes. This is about where water penetrates within bilayers, but then it drops off with very significant amplitude of motion. And this is the order parameter amplitude of motion down to the center of the bilayer. And each of these groups is undergoing rapid motion because these are narrow spectra. These two lines in the middle are from the methyl groups right at the center of the bilayer. And this happens to be the DMPC with cholesterol and without cholesterol. So you can see that cholesterol increases the order, which is exactly what's been shown by other spectroscopic methods as well. So that's just pure bilayers. This is DMPC. This happens to be DPPC, but it's the same. Exactly. This also reveals some interesting subtleties. This is DOPC, many of you know diolial, with a double bond here. So this is unsaturated. What does that do to it? <clears throat> well, what that does to it is it changes significantly the order parameter around the center of the bilayer. As I said, this is where water penetrates. And this was identified by Joe Staley, as I said. So here you now have the precise uh, position of this uh, CD bond. And it's quite interesting that most saturated lipids in biology, uh, unsaturated or unsaturated around the center of the, of the lipid. And the, the, these are the deuteration sites uh, of the system. So, um, what about looking at how proteins can interact or intercalate into bilayers? Well, here is an amyloid polypeptide, which has been looked at, and they're looking at the penetration into the upper half of the membrane. So here is our lipid, uh, here is our bilayer, and this is the model they have. And here, what they're doing is, this is the pure lipid bilayer, this is the deuterium spectrum, and as we add more and more peptide, the order profile changes dramatically or more so in the upper half of the bilayer than it does in the lower half. And this is the same, we've done this for toxins, for example, a number of uh, membrane penetrating peptides. And typically these will penetrate to about halfway down the half of the bilayer. And this was followed up by lots of other biophysical evidence as well. So this is a, a, an interesting and sensitive way of looking at the intercalation of peptides. And this is a relatively recent study here uh, of lipids by deuterium NMR um, 
in, into bilayer. So that's an, a nice biological example. Well, lots of molecules bind to the surface of membranes, you know that too. So PKA uh, of interconnecting species is something you can measure. I told you NMR is, inter in, in, uh, is sensitive to charge, but in this case, this is the ionization state of a small um, local anesthetic, in this case, that interconnects into bilayers by looking at the change in the structural parameters in the membrane. So here we are, this is a uh, phospholipid, it's just a choline. Deuteration is at these two positions in the choline head group, and they are going to be reporting on us, to us on the ionization state of this quaternary ammonium here in the tetracaine. And here we go from the pure lipid to adding tetracaine, and you can see there are changes here. And those changes are reflecting the um, local structural perturbations that are occurring in the membrane surface due to ionization of tetracaine. So here is just the lipid over a pH range from three to, to about 11. Now we add tetracaine and you're pulling out rather precisely the pKa of tetracaine in the bilayer. And this is a notoriously difficult, as partition coefficients are notoriously difficult to measure for uh, small molecules into liquid bilayers. Here you are looking specifically at the bilayer perturbation by the ionization state here. A non-perturbing way of determining surface titration. <clears throat> well, a lot of lipids in nature, of course, are anionic. Um, there's no cationic, but they're anionic lipids. Cytochrome C binding, again, something we and many others have been looking at. What we find is cytochrome C is not a rigid crystalline molecule when it binds to membranes. It undergoes very significant dynamics. That's another story by looking at phosphorus relaxation. But if we want to look at the, um, the binding, here we have phosphodinoglycerol. Here we have the head groups of the lipids, which we can resolve. This is deuterated in the glycerol head group. And now we can look at the fast motions, the relaxation properties of our deuterium on binding of cytochrome C. Not much happens, but the slow motions, and here we're in the millisecond time range, millisecond to microsecond time range, we're seeing that they are perturbed by the binding of cytochrome C. So this is a very subtle um, uh, identification of, of dynamics that are going on with membrane surfaces as cytochrome C, which is known to bind to these bilayers, bind. And uh, I just saw a talk earlier this week um, from a meeting that I was in, in Portugal. And this kind of thing is, 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 is actually split, explicit to the way in which cytochrome C delivers electrons. Okay, so that's lipids in bilayers. There's many, many, hundreds of papers in the literature on which you are. What about ligands and prosthetic groups in membranes? Well, I think many of you know this system. These are retinal rod cells at the back of your eye. Here are the discs that are in there. And the rhodopsin, of course, is the photoreceptor protein um, in mammalian eyes. It's what gives you essentially red eye in the back of your eye from in a photograph. And it's this chromophore a vitamin A derivative, uh, retinaldehyde, which is now in the rhodopsin, which is a GPCR, and many of you know about all this, of course. And the nice thing here is that the membrane is pretty high density of this. It's about 60 or 70 lipids per one rhodopsin, and rhodopsin is the, the, the predominant molecule in these disc membranes. And it's possible now to, uh, this is a, an early electron diffraction pattern, there is now crystal structures for rhodopsin um, <clears throat> from Chris Palczewski, but then there are two or three others now in the database. And the most important thing to note is that the resolution in these kind of electron diffraction patterns is nowhere near sufficient to observe the retinal within the rhodopsin. Indeed, the crystal structures, very often the retinal is modeled back into those crystal structures using solid state NMR data from the retinal itself because the resolution in the diffraction is not high enough. And in fact, this is probably the most important part of the molecule, but you can't see it. So NMR has been able to, uh, to, to resolve the confirmation precisely. So um, the most important part is the chromophore not well resolved in ground state or activated state. Nice thing about NMR is that you can put a membrane into the NMR machine, you can look at it in the dark, then you can shine light on it and you can do an experiment uh, in the light. So, whereas crystallography, you need lots of different crystals at different forms and we're doing a lot of that kind of work as well. 
<clears throat> so just to kind of show you an example, here is uh, the bond vectors. Here we've deuterated specifically the retinal the three positions along the, 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 the polyene chain here. We've also deuterated other positions, but these are the important ones. And this is the confirmation. These are the bond vectors that we can measure by the oriented membranes, by deuterium NMR, in the dark, and then in the light. And so now we can see um, uh, how the, the, the chromophore changes during the isomerization that occurs when you put light onto this protein, and we can feed that back into the protein crystal structure. A couple of interesting things. The methyl groups here are undergoing very fast rotation in this system, and that we can measure by NMR. And also we have a 6S trans ring. So in other words, we've got information about the beta ion ring here. And, and that, of course, came out from these publications. Something else that um, modeling a crystal structure of retinol in, into a crystal structure of protein will not tell you, but NMR does tell you, is that the polyene chain is curved. And this was uh, interesting uh, to see, and now that fits the electron density profiles of high resolution structures. So the retinol in a crystal is, is, is extended, but in the protein, it's actually curved. And that's important for the activation of the rhodopsin um, in this system. So, you know, you get new surprises by using NMR approaches, which are relatively non-perturbing, non-crystallizing, and in natural membranes and all the natural lipids in the system. So let me give you another ligand uh, example. Many of you will know this as an electric fish, it's a torpedo monorata. It's a good model for the acetylcholine receptor, which is in high density in the neural membranes of this. Here is some low resolution electron microscopy from Nigel Lundwin. <clears throat> but the activating, one of the most abundant neurotransmitters in our brain is acetylcholine. And here is acetylcholine. It binds to two of the monomers of this pentamer somewhere around here. Um, we now have a high resolution crystal structure of the extramembranous parts. And what we've done is we've deuterated it in the quaternary ammonium group of the acetylcholine um, and looked at it binding to the protein in these kind of semi purified membranes with all the natural lipids and all the other natural proteins with very specific binding of the acetylcholine. And we've used deuterium NMR to look at the orientation in particular of the binding site. And this is quite important because. This was the electron density resolved by Nigel Unwin and his colleagues, and it was not clear where the binding site was or what orientation it was within the protein. And the deuterium NMR spectra gave orientational dependence, and the line shape was sensitive to molecular motion. So we could use those spectra. And if you look here, in oriented membranes of uh, acetylcholine is bromelated in this case to fix it in the site, but that's a technicality. We can see the spectrum here, the membranes which are oriented with the magnetic field parallel to the membrane normal, compared to over here on the right, perpendicular to the membrane normal. The spectral shape changes very dramatically indeed. These are computer simulations of the spectra, and you can each one of these orientations, we could measure many from 0 to 90, is a unique piece of information. And then this is plus five degrees, minus five degrees. So we can look at the, uh, the, the error on this, on the, um, the precision of this measurement. And what we pulled out was the acetylcholine binding site is at 42 degrees with respect to the membrane normal. And these methyl groups that we have deuterated are undergoing very fast rotational motion within the binding site. And that again has been used computationally later by people for um, tertiary uh, ammonium. Uh, drugs which compete for acetylcholine in a medicinal context. And now that's a big area, but this was quite important to guide some of those studies. So, um, sorry, I'm going backwards here. So here's a, a final example. Uh, this is membrane-bound ATPases. Those who had breakfast this morning, this protein is pumping proteins, uh, um, protons in, into your, uh, your gut, the gastric ATPase. And then the sodium um, ATPase is an analogous protein. We now have some high resolution structures, in fact, in Denmark, which were not available when we did this, this work, which was together with drug companies. And what they wanted to know is whether inhibitors of these ATPases, and this is one particular one from Roche, uh, 
and this is wellbane, which is a poison which will kill you. Where do they bind in this protein? How do they bind? And uh, crystal structures now show that, in fact, the, the, the deuterium NMR uh, information was correct. So let me just show you an example with kidney ATPase. Here we are looking at the uh, wallbane, which is a cardiac glycoside. Uh, so the Ramnos sugar is here, and then the sterol nucleus is here. And what we've done is we have um, put in NMR nuclei on here and worked out the confirmation of that uh, molecule in the protein. So that was a confirmation, we got that. And then crystallography subsequently, some years later came along, but what they could not resolve in the crystallography was the Ramnos group here. There's no electron density associated with that sterile parts here. And we used deuterium to try and resolve that question, what the problem was. The way we did that was to again, come back to the wobane, the small molecule, we labeled with deuterium and also carbon-13 and fluorine, as I said, the confirmation, but we labeled with deuterium here and here. So this is going to be telling us about the motion of the, the, uh, the, 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 the steroid nucleus. This is going to be telling us about the Ramnos. Now, you might think, well, why is that important? Well, it turns out that the spectrum from the steroid nucleus is this broad and simulated and unique broad pattern which told us that the steroid part is fixed down in the protein. This was all done before crystallography. And then the Ramnos, when we put the deuterium here, gives this isotropic spectrum, which I showed you earlier, comes from a very freely mo mo mobile deuterium. So we have differential mobility of wobbling when bound to a kidney ATPase. So crystallography is not going to help you here. You can see electron density about the steroid, but not about the Ramnos. NMR is telling you why and differential mobility is really very, very important for drug action. You make this molecule and you restrict that chemically between the steroid and the Ramnos. In other words, you make it rigid, the thing doesn't work. It is just totally ineffective. That differential mobility is vital for function. I wouldn't uh, advise looking at Warbane uh, without very serious uh, health and, and safety requirement because it is a lethal poison, as I said earlier. But this work was, uh, uh, was quite instrumental in starting a whole new range of differential mobility drug design. Uh, and that's something else that came from deuterium. Okay, so that's this bit. What about now membrane protein structure to finish off? Um, I'm now going to tell you about some very recent work because the technology deuteration facilities, the, the way in which we can do deuteration is only now becoming really realized. And here is a timeline, if you like, by increasing spectral resolution using exchangeable protons, as I told you, and reduced spectral broadening, as I told you earlier, both in protons and C13. And it's these large 100 kilohertz, and I, I mentioned that intentionally, I'll come to it in a moment, causes spectral broadening. So one possible solution here, replace protons by deuterons in membrane proteins. Can this be done? Well, yes. This is proton content, okay? So this is 100% protons, 100% deuterons, but we only ever get to about 10% deuterium here. And so that's a, a kind of a timeline, if you like, a, a line of improvement. And that usually is with time, how we're doing better and better in deuterating membrane proteins. And along uh, at this rate are the kind of resolution you're getting for spectra. And I think if you look at some of these here, the resolution we're getting now, this is one of our examples, is getting really rather good for um, um, uh, spectra here for bacteriodopsins. It happens as a model system, but there are others that have now been used on PEX, for example, a beta barrel protein here. So as deuteration has improved, spectra have improved. But also this magic angle spinning technology I mentioned to you is getting better. So here's 10 to 15 kilohertz. This is going up to 40 to 60. And this was the first example of 60 kilohertz. We're now up to 100 kilohertz magic angle spinning. So now the, the resolution is really getting rather good and it's becoming comparable to what we have for solution soluble protein. And this is OMPEX in a membrane with lipids. That's the important thing, membrane proteins like their membrane lipids. 
In fact, they need to have them around for being fully functional and competent. So this is the way the field has been going over the last 10 years or so. And it's particularly encouraging, and I'm quoting here from this article I showed you here, that's our paper, that's the review article of it, that we're now getting up to 300 residues. And here are some of the systems. You will recognize immediately that many of them have alpha helices or beta barrels, uh, structural elements, which are relatively rigid within the membrane. And that's what we're, we're looking at here. And here is an example, it's an unpaid. Crystallography shows it's a crystal structure that's been done for some while. But what it tells us in a membrane, and NMR tells us, and deuterium helps us, it's not a rigid protein. Membrane proteins are not rigid in membranes. They have lots of flexibility. And that explains, of course, why loops are poorly resolved in most diffraction patterns of membrane proteins. But what it tells us is these beta barrels have a rocking motion. Here they are, and they, they, they can rock within the membrane. They're rocking around. And the NMR is giving us an indication of that from the order parameters from the different labeled um, residues within the, uh, the protein. We have flexible root loops. We know that. We've identified loops. Crystallography distorts roots. roots. We've shown that. We've done that by NMR, by labeling the, the loops, and then comparing it to the highest resolution crystal structures and show that crystal packing does distort loops in membrane proteins. So you really need to do this in a membrane without crystal packing. And then protons detected in solid state NMR at 60 megahertz, that's what this one was. Gigahertz spectrometers so we're going up in field as well, and they are becoming available. 1.2 may well go to uh, these places that can afford them, like EDA Zurich, for example. And then this one was reconstituted back into lipids. I think it's probably a, a BMPC or a BMPC. Um, a GPCR has been resolved in nano disks by Standard Palace Group. And here are some of the NMR spectra. You can see that they did structural resolution. What I've done here is compared his structure by NMR with an X-ray crystal structure, the cytokine receptor. And here are the backbones. And you can see that in green, we've got the crystal structure from crystallography using lipid, lipid phase uh, crystallography. And then from, uh, sorry, XRD uh, crystallography is in pink and NMR is green. So the crystallography was done in lipidic phases. This was done in membrane bilayers and bicells in fact. And you can see there are subtle differences and those differences almost certainly are due to the lipid environment giving a different conformational flexibility and also structure uh, compared to a crystal. So where would you find these structures? Well, there are about 240 membrane protein structures in the PDB from NMR. And though I haven't checked every one, but it wouldn't surprise me if all are deuterated. And they are usually in these kind of uh, membrane mimetics going from these smolts, which we've worked on and used extensively, but also nanodisks and bicells and even bilayers. So deuterium is vital for this kind of area. And here are two particular web pages I've given me, the one is here from Joel Barchowski and Steve White and others, showing all of those and their condition and the resolution and the lipid they're in, because the lipid is important by uh, these methods. Just very recently, a couple of very nice primers have come out on um, how to do solid state NMR right the way from experimental flow design, protein production, sample how it gets into the NMR rotor, into the magic angle spinning, for example, sample packing, and even they've given you where to get and which kind of reagents you need for deuteration to grow proteins in bacterial systems, of course, ready for deuterium NMR. And also, um, of course, I shouldn't, uh, uh, I need to mention the deuteration laboratory in ILL, uh, not least because they have a very nice web page. There's lots of protocols for lipids and so on. We've given some protocols to that page. And there's a lot of deuteration expertise in the world and around. And uh, people like Michael Hartwein, of course, Joe Forsyth, uh, who everybody knows, involved in this deuteration lab, which was one of the first set up. And now there are many uh, around. And it's not trivial for membrane protein. And they have some fantastic expertise, and Juliet in particular, for protein production. So there's a lot of resource out there for people who need it. And just to finish, there is a conference coming up, Biophysics. Neutrons, NMR will be there. It's a hybrid meeting, it's fully flexible, cancel and so on. Um, and I will be there, I hope, in July, if the Austrians allow Britain and people from the UK to go, uh, then I will be there. 
And thank you very much, Tommy, and thank you, everyone. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Tony, for this uh, fantastic overview of, of all the exciting thing you can uh, obtain with NMR and on membrane protein and lipids. So really appreciate it. So is there uh, some questions? One, uh, one there is a lot of clapping of hands. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is there a question for somebody? Yeah. yeah. Can I? Yeah. Can I? Um, yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, from my previous experience, it's very difficult to infer the order parameter from uh, uh, per deuterated molecules because uh, these uh, splittings sometimes they overlap, and it's difficult to assign to a special CD uh, bond in the molecule. And I'm wondering if there are any good now deconvolution uh, 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 like softwares, or it is still better to do partial deuteration to see exactly uh, which, um, yeah. Yes, thank you very much. That's an important question. And certainly in the early days, this is one that we tried to address. So you're right, partial and specific deuteration is a way forward. But there are depaking programs which you can use to computer simulate your spectrum and then try to optimize the fitting of the spectrum to the depaking program. And that is the best way forward. But you are right, there could be overlap, especially between carbon two and carbon eight, where all the order parameters are very similar in the upper half of the bilayer. Trying to deconvolute that is, is quite difficult. As you get further down the chain to the center of the bilayer, then it's easier because the, quad the, the, the quadrupole splitting is uh, more separated. But you're absolutely right. The other difficulty with this kind of system, and people have made mistakes here, is that if you have slow molecular motion, then you're not fully averaging the quadrupolar anisotropy, and you therefore get broad lines. And so a way of improving that is to increase the temperature if you can in your system. So I, I always have a bit of an issue with order parameters for gel phase bilayers, for example. I think you have to know what you're doing and you have to be very specific about the dynamic range you're, you're in. Biology is totally fluid as a rule, of course. So, but you're right, it is an important problem. There are deep peaking programs out there and the experts still in this field are people like Michael Brown, for example, in Tucson. He's the person who approach, for example. Okay, I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's still very difficult to, to, to do this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Wahid has a question. Yes, uh, thank you so much. It was a very interesting presentation. Uh, I have a question. Um, yeah, I'm a study interaction between, for example, boil salt and uh, boil layer phospholipids. Uh, if I prepare, for example, um, a liposome from deuterated partial or fully deuterated uh, liposome and then added boisol to them. Uh, uh, my question is that can I, from this NMR technique, can I get information, especially about distribution of the boisol inside the uh, uh, liposome, for example, is it, uh, can I see any difference if there is a difference between uh, outer and inner leaflet? Can I get those kind of information from uh, NMR point of view? Ah, so now you're asking something about membrane asymmetry. And as you know, that is a pretty tough thing to try and determine that. Can you make asymmetric feasible? Uh, I assume that uh, I assume that they, it's distributed randomly, but I assume that the boil salt, it goes mostly to the outer leaflet. And uh, I just want to somehow prove that, uh, that if it's this hypothesis is true, yeah. So what you're asking is if you can distinguish the outside bilayer from the inner bilayer of a liposome. Now we have been making, an, and um, London has, has been making asymmetric lipid bilayers. And if you can make an asymmetric lipid bilayer, then you could put your deuterium in the outside and do a measurement, put your deuterium on the inside, deuterate lipids, and then do a measurement. Mm -hmm. So that you could do if you predetermine the physical asymmetry of the liposome to begin with. 
And it's quite tough to do, but mm. these asymmetric bilayers, so, I mean, in biology, all membranes are asymmetric, but to achieve it technically has been quite mm. difficult. But uh, you, 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 you can start to do that, and maybe you can try and do that. And you should be able to do that with liposomes. Now, whether you can do it with straightforward symmetric liposomes and distinguish both leaflets, that, that is something that, that is also uh, of interest, I guess. There have been ways of using lanthanide shifts and phosphorus NMR. Now that you can do if you can look at the phosphorus signal from the outside leaflet and perturb that with a lanthanide that does not penetrate the bilayer. That was done many years ago by Bistrop. Then you can distinguish what's happening in the outer leaflet compared to the inner leaflet. So if you use something else to help you distinguish the outer and the inner leaflet, that maybe physically making asymmetric bilayers would be the most convincing way forward to that. Okay, so biosolves, you will certainly see the perturbation of the surface of the bilayer. You will be able to see whether they penetrate the upper half. You'll be able to see the packing. You'll be able to see titration behavior because these are presumably ionizable compounds. So yes, you can see all of that for sure. And there's a good literature on all of that. Thank you. Pleasure. Any more questions? So I'm sure um, uh, uh, Professor Watts will be happy to receive uh, emails and with questions and so on, uh, even after when you have uh, studied the uh, slides or, or uh, revisited the lecture. So, so uh, with this, I, I would really like to thank uh, Tony for uh, doing such a Wonderful lecture and, and uh, put, pointing out uh, the, the, the differences and complementarity between uh, scattering and, and um, NMR. I mean, you can get a lot of uh, additional information by combining the two techniques. So. Yeah, and in many of these systems that are deuterated for NMR, you can apply deuterium um, yeah. neutron uh, experiments too, as we have done many times. So. Yeah, yeah. Didn't ask me to talk about that, but that's a whole new lecture on how to compare deuterium yeah. NMR and deuterium in, in neutron experiments. But that that is certainly a, a very viable way forward. And you only have to make the deuterium labeled material once, and you can use it in two big facilities, so you can get a lot back. Well, it's been a pleasure, and thank you very much for asking me. I'm really sorry I can't be in Sweden. I love Sweden. I love Scandinavia. Yeah. Clearly, I have some roots somewhere in Scandinavia uh, in my past generations, and uh, I wish you luck with the Sweetness course. Great. And good to see you, Tommy, and everybody.